Well, friends, it's Saturday night and this afternoon we all received word that we were going back into lockdown, this time with the whole state. And uh, that means we can't gather for church tomorrow, which I know for many of us is a great sadness, but we trust that God is at work in every circumstance. In a moment, I'm going to pray and then uh, there'll be a short video, a message from Bishop Mark that he also recorded uh, on this day, Saturday. Uh, and then we'll move into a, a, a short form of church service. I hope you'll find encouragement in it, and I hope that uh, it will be not long before we can gather together again. But now let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you are wise uh, beyond our understanding, that you are completely sovereign, and that you have only our good at heart. And so even though we may find uh, the current circumstances frustrating, a cause of anxiety and sorrow. Now for some of us, they may, it may bring loneliness and isolation. Uh, but Father, we do pray that you'll help us to know that you are at work for our good. And we pray today as we gather around your word in this online format, that you will encourage us, strengthen us in our faith, draw us near to you and equip us for your service. And these things we ask in Jesus' great name. Amen. Friends, as I record this on Saturday, the 14th of August, the new COVID cases today stood at 466. And we are truly shocked and alarmed every day as the figures keep rising. And even just as I was recording this, I've received a text to say that the whole of regional New South Wales will go into lockdown as in 5 p.m. this afternoon, Saturday, the 14th of August. I wonder how you're feeling about this. It seemed back in May we had everything under control and now with the Delta variant everything seems completely out of control and we wonder how we're ever going to get back to anywhere near where we were. And I don't know about you but I think many are feeling um, anxious. Uh, they, they wonder whether we'll ever get out of this situation, whether ever come out of lockdown now. Um, some of you perhaps have entered into your own personal lockdown um, because you haven't wanted to go anywhere near where you might catch the virus. And maybe the events of these past weeks have caused you to go out and get a vaccination when uh, earlier on you were hesitant. I was reading from Mark's Gospel this morning, uh, the many people healed by Jesus and how he would just speak and the wind and the waves would stop. And I began to think about, well, why doesn't he just call a halt to COVID-19 and its impact? I've called for that. You've prayed for that. I'm sure many around the world have prayed that the Lord would miraculously intervene. Why hasn't he done so yet? We don't know the answer to that question, but we keep trusting the sovereign, wise purposes of God, whose ways and thoughts are higher and more magnificent than ours. And we trust that he has yet good things to bring from this. Maybe around the globe, maybe around the nation, maybe around the diocese, more people are calling on him in a way that they've never done before. And maybe that course of action has yet to call more people into, back to relationship with him. I don't know. I'm, I'm just surmising. There have been good things that have come from this. The discovery of ministry online, the fact that I can be in your lounge rooms like I am, uh, the fact that meetings can still occur, that we can still meet up with each other uh, via Zoom or some other modern technology. Um, the fact that in our ministry is for everyone conference, more people have actually been able to take part than we originally hoped for. But we'll never know all the reasons behind God's good and sovereign purposes. Do you know, when the Apostle Paul asked that his thorn in the side be removed, and we don't know what that was, the Lord said, no, but my grace is sufficient for you. That's what he's saying to you today. In all the uncertainty, in all the anxiety, in all the confusion, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you to rest in me, to trust in me, not to be anxious, even not to feel lonely. My grace is sufficient for you to sustain you through these hard times. Many of you have known very hard times before, much more than I have. And you know that the Lord has brought you through before. And the Lord will bring us all through this time once more. 
So run to him, turn to him, rest in him. All the things I've encouraged you to do before. But today, sit and be still with him and know that he is God and run to him as your refuge and strength and very present help. And therefore, do not fear as you draw strength from his strength. Let me pray. Father, we have just been reminded that when the Apostle Paul asked that that which was a thorn in his side be taken away, you did not take it away, but promised that your grace would be sufficient. We ask you, Lord, to bring a hasty end to the impact of COVID-19 in our nation and around the world. And if that, that is not to be at this time, may we find your grace indeed to be sufficient for us. Sufficient for us not to fret, not to be anxious, sufficient for us not to be lonely or feel isolated, grace to cope with the frustrations, the inconvenience, the uncertainty, the change of plans, grace to keep delighting in you, delighting in prayer and the reading of your word, grace to know our relationship with you strengthened through this trial. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, I do hope you have your Bible handy or your bulletin with the passage printed on it uh, as we turn now and read from Mark chapter 7, beginning at the first verse. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered round Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come for the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash, and they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers and kettles. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, Why don't your disciples leave according to the tradition of the elders, instead of eating their food with defiled hands? He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, These people honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. And he continued, You have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, Honour your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is korban, that is, devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And you do many things like that. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. After he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Are you so dull, he asked? Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach, and then out of the body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. He went on, What comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it, yet he could not keep his presence secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an impure spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, born in Syrian Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. First, let the children eat all they want, he told her. For it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Lord, she replied, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he told her, for such a reply you may go, the demon has left your daughter. She went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Open our eyes, Lord, that we might see the wonderful truths contained in your word and that we might see the wonderful Saviour who, to whom they point us, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. The Pharisees were a formidable and influential group in Jesus' day. Essentially, uh, they were a holiness movement. They weren't the official religious leaders, the, the priests and the temple servants. They were lay people, but nevertheless highly regarded, even revered by the average Jewish citizen. They were extremely strict in their observance of religious rules, not just the laws of the Old Testament, but a whole bunch of other religious rules that have been developed over time. Their zeal was unparalleled. And the reason for their zeal was that they believed that only when they and the whole nation lived in strict conformity to these rules, only then would God send his Messiah. 
Only when the nation was truly righteous, as they defined righteousness, only then would God send, send another king like the great King David. This new king would gather them together and, and lead them in overthrowing their oppressors, the Roman Empire. He would establish God's kingdom in Israel and make Israel great again. But not till everyone was living the way the Pharisees said they needed to live. That's what they believed. I reckon they were a pretty intimidating bunch. Um, just look at what happens in the opening verses of Mark 7. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered round Jesus. And they saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. So some of Jesus' disciples are having a meal and, and they haven't washed their hands. Now, that doesn't just mean they were a bit grubby like a lot of teenage boys. This was a much bigger deal than that. Before Jews ate a meal back then, they were supposed to go through a special hand-washing ceremony. At least that's what the Pharisees and other religious types said. Now today, we all know about proper hand-washing. Uh, there are signs everywhere to remind us about it. But this was not that. This was a ritual hand-washing. It wasn't about physical hygiene. It was about spiritual cleansing. Uh, it was about washing the world off you. And if you didn't do it, it, it was kind of like eating the food without God's okay. And that wasn't a good thing. The Pharisees wouldn't dream of doing anything other than what they were supposed to do. Their whole code was to get everything right. Uh, and just as doctors and nurses have to wash their hands very thoroughly and with the right technique before they perform a medical procedure or operation, now, these guys were, were kind of like religious medical professionals. They would wash their hands just the right way and for the right amount of time. <laughs> Again, it sounds very familiar, doesn't it? Uh, and these guys would probably feel pretty good about it too because this was their field of competence, their area of expertise. So when they see Jesus' disciples not doing what they're supposed to, they can't help but point it out. Have a look again at verse 5. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, Why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? You can imagine that right about now the disciples would not be feeling very good about themselves. The Pharisees were their religious superiors and they'd caught the disciples out. They weren't up to scratch. They'd blown it, religiously speaking. And it probably wasn't the first time. I wonder how many of us sometimes feel like that, or maybe often. We know what we're supposed to do. We know what a, a Christian looks like, the sorts of things we should do and the sorts of things we shouldn't do. We know we're not supposed to, to swear or gossip or play fast and loose with the truth. We know we're supposed to be kind and patient with difficult people and to care for those on the margins of society. But it's hard. Sometimes it's just easier to accept that you're a kind of second-rate Christian. If we think of the church like a sporting team, we just accept that other Christians will be out on the field playing the game and, and we'll spend most of our time just sitting on the bench. And so we don't worry about trying too hard. But you see, Jesus takes a very different view. In fact, he turns everything upside down. Everything that the disciples and the Pharisees and pretty much every Israelite thought about religion and about being accepted by God, Jesus turned it all on its head. According to him, as we read in verses 6 uh, through to 8, the Pharisees are a bunch of hypocrites. He takes the words of Isaiah from about seven or 800 years before, spoken about the people of Israel back in his day, and Jesus applies those words to these religious elites. 
they are only skin deep. They have hard hearts and their religion is empty and man-made. Their kind of religion is all about how things look, but it doesn't deal with the things that really matter. This whole incident shows us two completely different types of religion, two radically opposed ways of approaching God. There's the approach that the Pharisees were following, religion that is mainly concerned with how things look. And then there's the other kind, the kind of religion that Jesus was on about, that's concerned first and foremost with what's happening on the inside, what's happening in a person's heart. It's not that behaviour doesn't matter. Jesus never said that. It's a matter of what comes first, uh, where the starting point is. And that's the point that Jesus goes, uh, goes on to make in the next few verses. That the Pharisees are fine at ceremonial hand-washing. They're exceptional at getting people to, don to donate money for the church rather than use it for other things. You wouldn't mind a Pharisee as one of your church wardens, perhaps. But just ask them how they are when it comes to things that lie closest to God's heart, like honouring their parents. Now, Jesus is just picking out one example here to show the problem with the way they were going about things. But as he makes clear at the end of verse 13, it's just one of many examples. And the example he gives highlights the problem with their whole approach to God. Now, they have made up their own system of religion, a whole lot of do's and don'ts, ways to keep God happy. But there's a, a big problem, and that is that they ignore what God himself wants. They set aside what God himself had told them he wanted. As Jesus puts it, you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. They made God's word nothing. Now, in the Anglican Church, our chief statement of belief, apart from the creeds, is the, uh, the 39 Articles of Religion. Listen to what the first sentence of Article 6 says. Uh, I'm reading it in a modernised form, but I've I printed the modern form and the original words in the weekly bulletin. Holy Scripture contains all things necessary for salvation. Consequently, whatever is not read in Scripture, nor can be proved from Scripture, cannot be demanded from any person to believe it as an article of the faith. Nor is any such thing to be taught necessary, sorry, to be thought necessary or required for salvation. Those words setting the priority of the Bible, its authority over everything else in the church, those words written nearly 500 years ago trace their origin all the way back to these words of Jesus to the Pharisees here in Mark chapter 7. Jesus was establishing the priority of God's word recorded in scripture over any other ideas or teaching. Everything which conforms to his word should be upheld. Anything which contradicts his word should be rejected. That wasn't how the Pharisees were doing things. They said, if you use your money for God's work, then it's okay if you don't look after your aging parents properly. But God says in Exodus and Deuteronomy, honour your father and your mother. The Pharisees said, wash your hands properly before you eat a meal and make sure that other people do it too. Get the rituals right. But God says in Amos chapter 5, I hate all your show and pretense, the hypocrisy of your religious festivals and solemn assemblies. Jesus was declaring that when it comes to your standing with God, there are essentially two possible ways for him to assess you. One, he's going to look at you on the outside, how you keep the rules. Or two, he's going to look at you on the inside, 
what's going on in your heart. It's important to understand that when Jesus says heart, he's not using it the way that we mostly do today. He's not talking about our feelings. In the thought world of his day, the heart was the centre of your being, uh, the seat of your will, the, the place from which you decided how to speak and act. It encompasses both your thoughts and your affections. <clears throat> and Jesus says, of course, God's going to look inside at your heart because that's where the real action is. It's what's in your heart that will determine what you do and how you act. Have a look at verses 14 and 15. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it's what comes out of a person that defiles them. When the disciples ask Jesus about this later on, see what he says to them in verses 17 to 19. In effect, you think that how you wash your hands is what matters to God? You think that if you don't eat certain kinds of food, God will smile on you and you'll be okay with him? But you've got it all back to front. Hand washing rituals and certain kinds of food might have something to do with your physical well-being or your social approval, but your spiritual condition is all about your heart. Let me give a couple of examples with regard to our speech that may be a bit closer to our experience rather than ceremonial hand washing. Most of us would probably agree that we're not supposed to swear. Uh, we've been taught at some point along the way that Christians shouldn't use bad language. Now, we might have different views about what kind of language actually is bad, and, and we may well admit that sometimes our own language is not always what it should be, but we know that Christians shouldn't do it. But Jesus would say to us, it's not so much your language that makes you unclean as it is your unclean heart that corrupts your language. To put it another way, a foul mouth is a symptom of a foul heart. Or think of our speech from another angle, from the opposite direction. It's not that hard to talk like a Christian, to use the right words and phrases, to, to express the right ideas, so that people say of us, oh, he's a fine Christian man, or she's a good Christian woman. But Jesus would say to us, you can sound like the best Christian in all the world, but I know your heart, and I'm not easily fooled. That's the problem, isn't it? We know. We know that what's in our hearts is anything but clean. Sure, we might not think of ourselves as particularly bad people, but we know that our hearts are not up to what God wants of us. Jesus says it with brutal honesty in verses 20 to 23. What comes out of a person is what defiles them, for it's from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance and folly, all these evils come from inside and defile a person. It's not that we're all guilty of all these kinds of evils to their worst degree, but the elements are there in all of us. The, the poison ingredients are ready to hand. As someone once said, a polluted river runs through every human heart. It's easy to point at murderers and rapists and child molesters, at, at drug addicted thieves and violent abusers, at corrupt CEOs and, and dishonest politicians, and to say, now that's a bad person. But Jesus will tell us that the same things the same things that lead such people to do the things they do, those same seeds of wickedness are in your heart and in mine. It's a pretty grim picture, isn't it? If that was all Jesus told us, if we stopped there, 
um, we'd have every reason to sort of throw in the towel right now and just give way to despair. If this was all we knew of Jesus' teaching, we might well decide that it's all too hard and just give up. But we do know that it's true, or we at least suspect that it is. Most of us, at least in our more honest moments, will admit to our failings and shortcomings and acknowledge our bad attitudes. Our hearts are corrupt and our lives are defiled. And if we don't know this, there's probably someone who knows us well enough to assure us that it's true. We sense our heartfelt uncleanness and we know that no matter how many good things we do, no matter how hard we strive to be good people, it doesn't change what's going on in our hearts. In the light of God's radiant purity, we are simply unclean. So what do we do? What's the solution? Well, the story that follows, the, the last part of our reading from verse 24, gives us a surprising answer. It's the story of the Greek woman from Syria and Phoenicia who begs Jesus to help her suffering daughter. This, this Gentile woman, simply by virtue of her identity, was considered unclean. From the Pharisees' point of view, she was the embodiment of uncleanness. By the standards of their kind of religion, she was without hope, doomed. And at first, Jesus seemed to confirm that attitude towards her. His words about not taking the children's bread and, and giving it to the dogs seem very harsh. And there's no doubt what he meant. The children are the people of Israel, and the dogs are Gentiles, non-Jewish people like her. It, it, it's as if he's confirming that this woman is doomed, that she has no hope. But as the conversation unfolds, it becomes clear that Jesus is testing her, searching her heart, drawing her out. And as he draws her out, we see that she had something which the Pharisees knew nothing about. She had a heart which was laid open before God. She knew her need. More particularly in that moment, she knew her daughter's need and she knew that Jesus was the only one who could meet it. She knew she had no right to demand anything of God, no basis on which to expect anything of Jesus. That's why she doesn't balk at Jesus' response, why she doesn't argue with him or, or bristle at his comparison to the dogs, because she understands that God is holy and righteous and good and that she deserved nothing from him. Her only hope was to throw herself on Jesus' mercy. And that was just what Jesus was looking for. See, that's what the Pharisees didn't get. They thought that being accepted by God was all about their righteousness, what they did. But what they actually needed to do was to throw themselves on God's mercy and to ask for his forgiveness and help. Friends, that's what God wants from each one of us. Hearts laid open before him. A brutally honest knowledge of our need of his forgiveness and help. And a cry for mercy, like, like a beggar who is starving for a few crumbs from the master's table. Some of us, I know, feel that deeply already. We have such a sense of failure and unworthiness that it's crushing us. It, it may not be obvious to the people around us. You know, sometimes we're very skilled at hiding these kinds of feelings. But when there's no one else around, when it's just us and God, we don't feel that we can ask him for anything because we're not worthy. And that's the point. 
That's the, the necessary condition to receiving anything from God. We need to come to that point where we, we recognise our unworthiness and can say to God, I don't deserve your forgiveness. I'm not worthy of your help. But please have mercy on me. Until we get to that point, we can't receive anything from him. But when we do come to that point, he overwhelms us with his kindness. Because Jesus gave his life for us, because on the cross Jesus paid the penalty for our sins and dealt once and for all with our uncleanness, when we ask God for mercy, he freely forgives us and gladly comes to our aid. Well, we're going to take a, a moment now to pray. Uh, so will you join me as I lead us in a short time of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are indeed merciful, that you stand waiting to show us your mercy, that you are good and wise and kind. Help us to know our unworthiness, to know our need of forgiveness, to humble ourselves and come to you. Father, I know many of us watching have done that, and yet we need to keep doing it. And if there are any watching today who've never really come to that point, Father, I pray that they'll be able to put their pride aside, to be brutally honest with themselves, and to kneel before you and humbly ask for your mercy. And we thank you that you promise, you promise that when we do that, you will forgive us and welcome us. Father, we do pray uh, for our world and ask for your mercy on it. We, uh, we know that uh, many are finding it really tough at the moment. And even though, as we keep reminding ourselves, uh, we've fared much better than most of the world in this pandemic, yet right now, uh, many are doing it tough. And right now, many are worried, worried that perhaps we will go the way of so many other countries. We do pray for your mercy on our nation. We do pray uh, for the vaccine rollout, for uh, the measures, the uh, health measures that the government has been putting in place and, and also in other states. We pray that they'll be effective, that this current outbreak uh, will reach its bounds soon and be brought under control that the numbers will start to go down again. We pray that people will be cooperative with the authorities even when they don't agree, uh, that the police uh, will find they don't need to issue as many fines because people are doing the right thing. We pray for our health workers, Father, who are working in the front line of this whole pandemic and who are bearing the brunt of it. Strengthen and sustain them and have mercy on them. And Father, we pray for our leaders. We, we love to knock them in Australia and yet so many of them are working so hard. Sustain and strengthen them and give them wisdom and grace in all they do. And Father, we pray for this region in which we live in the Central West, that not only will you have mercy with regard to this current pandemic of physical disease, but that you also have mercy on the souls of people throughout this region, that many will come to hear this message of the gospel that calls them to humble themselves before you, to acknowledge their unworthiness and their need of your forgiveness, that they might turn to you and put their trust in your Son and be saved in him. All these things we ask, Father, in his great name. Amen.
Eternal God and Father, by whose power we are created and by whose love we are redeemed, guide and strengthen us by your Spirit, that we may give ourselves to your service and live this week in love to one another and to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, for ever and ever. Amen. <laughs>